Arc Sydenham are back with another life-changing message. We truly hope that you're blessed and encouraged by the word that you hear in the sermon today. Hi, lovely people. Can you hear me? Sounds quiet. So um, I don't take it for granted being able to share the word. Um, It is a big responsibility and I'm grateful and thankful that pastor sees it fit to be able to hear from God in regards to giving me this space to share. Many of you have probably come from various different churches and it's not, it's not the dumb thing, but um, I'm very, very grateful and humbled at the same time. And I wanted to just say, I wanted to just say this, well, for those online, hi, um, my name is Debbie Worrell, and um, I wanted to say this, that in the midst of going through challenges, God will still call you. He will still tell you to be obedient. And regardless of what you're going through, he's going to say, are you willing? And I say that because um, we had uh, a date arranged in March for me to share the word. And um, pastor was kind enough to contact me on Thursday. Afternoon. <laughs> You said I'm free to share, right? And um, I said, yeah. And the reason why I said yes is because the word of God is in me. He flows through me. And so if pastor said, can you do this? Who am I to say no? And so I'm, I'm saying that because it links to what I'm going to be sharing with you. So we see that we have been, we've started the year off with prayer and fasting and some of us have already been stretched in that area. Some of us is like, oh, Jesus, this is a bit much. 36 and a half days, never done it in my life. But who can say that they wasn't blessed for it? You were blessed, right? You was blessed by that stretching, just that little bit of stretching. And I would say that that is a little bit of stretching. Because Jesus, our Lord and Savior, did it for 40 days, right? With just water in the wilderness. And we did it for 36 and a half days. And we ate in the, off, in the evening. So, enlarge, stretch, lengthen, and do not spare. So we're reading from Isaiah 54. And for those of you who are taking notes... Um, I did want to entitle this, um, you was born for this. That's what I was going to entitle it, title it. But then God said to me, where are your focus? Where are your focus? Where is your focus? So even though we are born to do things, God answers the question, where's your focus? So we're going to read from Isaiah 54, 1 and 3, 1 to 3. And it says, sing, O barren. Actually, let us all say this together. After three, one, two, three. Sing, O barren, you who have born, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate. Then the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For shall left and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. I think that's it. So I wanted you to pay attention to a couple of the words that are in there. So one of the words there says desolate. Let me hear you say desolate. Say it again, desolate. So desolate, a dictionary says that it is in in an uninhabited place, an emptiness. And so when we look at that scripture, it talks about an empty place, a place that is barren. You do not have anything growing there, anyone dwelling there, nothing. It is desolate. It is an 
unhabitable place and it is empty. How many of us have felt like that in times in our life? That in us, we know that there is greatness in us, but we feel empty. We feel like we might not even, God might not even really want to inhabit us. The things that we should be doing, we're not doing. I've felt like that. I've felt like I have been a des- in a desolate place on many occasions. But you know what? God is in the habit of filling things, isn't he? And we're going to look at the scriptures and look at what God actually does. Our focus in this scripture, the focus is on the barrenness. The focus is in, on the fact that the city was barren. And the Lord, the reason why it was barren was because of the rebellious people. Judah and Israel, they were rebellious and God was like, I'm done. No, I'm not done. I'm done. I'm not done. But at this point, he says, even though you are empty, even though you're void, even though you're not doing anything, I am going to do a new thing. I am going to cause this thing to spring forth. And it says that the women who have got husbands are going to have less children than those that are barren. And when I was looking at it, I was like, how is that possible? How would God fill those who are barren and those that are, are, are not? So there were people who have much and there were people that have none. And when you look at the scripture, when you go on to read it, and it's really good if you can read the whole of um, Isaiah 54. When you read it, it says that those same people who are looking at you and saying that you're barren, they are going to have less than you. They are not going to be able to attain what you attain because of God's goodness and his grace. So even though the, word, the focus is on the barrenness, if you notice, if we go back to verse, verse 1, it tells, us, it tells the, the people to sing. It tells them to rejoice. Because we was doing it here in this place. Even though we've been in a desolate place, even though we've been in a challenging place, some of us, we were singing, we was rejoicing, we was lifting up the name of the Lord. And we are saying and declaring into the atmosphere, our God is good. We love him. He is awesome. He is mighty. He is wonderful. And, and what that does, it fills us. It fills our soul. It causes us to think and shift everything that is going on in us. Sometimes people are waiting for a feeling, but the feeling isn't where it's at. By you worshipping, by you lifting up your, the name of the Lord, God is filling you with wisdom. He's filling you with knowledge. He's filling you with strength. He's giving you peace. People are waiting for somebody to come and speak to them. Somebody is waiting for someone to come and say, bro, God has given you peace. But if you are to dare to open your mouth and worship the Lord And say to him, you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of all honor. There is none like you. He will come and fill you. That's why he tells them to sing. Because they are are having to sing even though they cannot see anything. The land is barren. There is nothing going on there. The wombs are empty. The place is desolate. But he is saying, in the midst of it all, I want you to sing. Why? Because I have something for you. If you don't open your mouth, he cannot fill it. He cannot give you what he wants to give you if you do not be obedient to it. So what I wanted to say, that that was just a a little introduction. (laughs) I go off on a tangent. Hey, Jesus, what has just happened to my laptop? Oh, it's decided to cut and paste the diagram. Okay, I want to ask you a couple of things. Is your focus really on the barrenness? Is your focus on the things that are not working for you? I already know the answer to that, by the way, because God already told me. That's why he wants me to share this message. Because what I saw in the spiritual realm was like, you know when you've got um, wool and it's all twined up, but it's all knotted up? What I saw... God, I'm raveling that chaos and that confusion in your mind that is saying, I cannot have, I cannot do. 
and your focus is on the cannot and the fact that you do not have, your focus is on that. And God wants me to come and help you guys to unravel all of that in your mind and change your focus on the things that you do not have onto what you already have. Is that okay? So we already know that God is with us. We already know that he has gone ahead of us. We already know, actually, through the word of God, that we are victorious. Did you all know that? We are already, we've already won the battle. But you know what? We are on a journey. It is the process. It is the thing that we want to attain. It's the thing that we want to get to. You know, um, not last year, the year before, they said that they was going to uh, break my, uh, my shin bone and straighten it or I could have the option of having a partial knee replacement none of them sounds good to me but you know what the thought of no longer being in pain and being able to walk good it sounded appealing but I knew there was going to be a process and it was the process that I was thinking about that was making me say no I don't want to do this and this is where some of us are at it's the process we know the finish line, we know where we are going, we know that we are victorious, but it is the process that is making us say, I don't want to do this, this is too much. And so God wants us not to look so deeply at the process, but to really look at the finish line. Needless to say, I didn't have the shin bone broken, and I didn't have the partial knee replacement. God gave me some instructions and I followed those instructions. And so today, <laughs> I can jump, I can run, I can skip, I can do all the things that I wanted to do, only because I followed the instructions. And the instructions were simple. Get out of your bed and walk. Get out of your bed and walk. Simple instructions, right? But who would have thought that by me doing that, God was going to heal me. You wouldn't, because it's so simple. It's like, mm, nah. It's just minor. But through the obedience, God was able to heal. So, we're not going to look at what we are not able to do. We're not going to look at the things that is not working for us. If we're barren and we don't have the house, we don't have the car, we don't have the kids, etc. We are not going to focus on that because God's currency is faith, right? Yeah, and we focus on what we do not see. But we believe that God has already enabled us to have the things that we need to have. Um, I threw this scripture in there because I just thought it was important for me to share this. It speaks about the woman with the oil. So you know the woman with the oil? She didn't have anything, right? She literally just had oil in her house. She didn't have the jars or anything like that. She literally had the oil, and that was all that she had. But you know what? She was given simple instructions from the man of God. And it says in 1 Kings 17 and 12, it says, And surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread Oh, no, sorry, this is the, this is the woman with the, with the bread. I've got the oil as well that's coming, sorry. Um, so this one is the woman with the bread. She's got her two sons, and basically they, um, they've only got enough flour for them. They're going to eat that, and then they're going to basically die. So it says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replies, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. But you know what? I was thinking about this because I was thinking about the oil, the woman with the oil, and she's basically got her sons and she didn't have anything after her husband had died and she was widowed and she needed to live. But, you know, it was like, sell my kids or... Um, I can't do anything because I'm in debt because my husband's death. I thought about that and I thought about the bread that she made for Elijah. And Elijah came to her and he basically just said, feed me first. Feed me first. Make the bread, but feed me first. How many of us would have been like, get thee behind me? What do you mean feed you first? 
Do you know what I mean? I've got my son here. It's just me and my son. And you want me to feed you first. And I just told you that this is all that I've got. And after when I have this, that's it. We're done. We're destitute. How many of us would have said no in that, in that situation? Many of us would have. Because we wouldn't have seen it as the word of the Lord. We wouldn't have seen it as something that God is giving us instructions for. And this is why it's important to pay attention to what God is saying to you. To be discerning. To be able to open up your mind beyond yourself beyond your situation and beyond your circumstance and say, what is God saying to me? What is he saying to me? Is he using this person to speak into my life? And it can be simple instructions. You know what? Sometimes people are expecting, the da -da 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 -da. they're expecting that. They are because of church culture. But somebody can say something as simple as, sis, I don't really have much food in my house. Would you be able to lend me five pounds? Or God might even put it on your heart as he has done with me. And he said to me, for a whole month, he said to me um, to give this um, lady who's got five children during the summer holidays, he said to me, um, give her 50 pounds a week. I said, have you seen my bank account? <laughs> Jesus, have you seen my bank account? And he said, yes, I have seen your bank account. And I'm like, okay, well, if you're telling me to do that, then you are obviously going to make a way for it. I'm not going to lie, there were some weeks where I was just like, Jesus, you need to come through. Because I don't have, I don't even have it. And I've already promised this woman I'm going to give you 50 pounds throughout the six weeks holiday. And so there was probably like 60 something pounds in my account. And I was just like, okay, Jesus, here you go. And when I tell you God blessed me, when I went and looked back in my bank account, the Holy Spirit whispered to me, I, I know it was the Holy Spirit because I have no business looking in my bank account because I knew it was only £12 something in there. And it was like, look in the bank account. I was thinking to myself, what to torture myself? Like, I only know there's £12 in there. Why am I going to go and look in the bank account? And there was over £1,200 in my bank account. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm telling you, something as simple as that, and it's not even just about him giving me back the money, but supposing that I've got five children, supposing that that week... One of my children decided to give their life to the Lord. Come on now. That 50 pounds a week means nothing compared to what God can and will do. So the first thing that I'm looking at is the barrenness. The barrenness, the fact that it is empty. Do you know it's in all of these things, all of, this, all, of, all of the Bible, and I've read it several times in bits and pieces and everything, God is always filling, is always making, is always creating. So I wanted to share that with you because um, it says, um, the, the barren one, in the verse in the city of Jeru Jerusalem, barren, uh, I don't know what that really says, sorry. It says that the, the promise is greater than the past and her children will return to the city and so when I when I was reading it it made so much sense about how God will be in a place tell you to come come on yonder come to this place because I'm going to bless you I'm going to strengthen you I'm going to give you everything that you need and even when you read on through those scriptures it actually says that he made a promise it's a covenant he made a promise with them and he said that he's no longer going to deal with them like how he deal, dealt with um, in the flood. He said he's no longer, there's no longer going to be a flood. He now is going to deal with his people differently. I wanted to show you this because this is a promise that I take for myself seriously. And I want you to understand that even though you may be in a dry and desolate place, you might be in an empty place, that God has his prom pr promises and he makes covenants with his people. So when we come into Christ, we are adopted into Christ. He is now our father. And I was thinking about this the other day and it caused me to just cry because I was thinking about how I don't, I'm, I'm not my own. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. And anything that you purchase now becomes yours. It's, it's now yours. And you have the right to do with it whatever you want to do with it. And that's how it is with God. He has bought us with a price of his son, Jesus Christ. And so we are not of our own. We don't even, I was sitting and I was thinking about it. I was meditating on it until I was just crying because I was thinking, 
the things that I want to do, the way I want to think, the way I want to be, I don't even have the right to do that because I've been bought with a price. And the thing is, being bought with a price, you now say, I belong to you. You do as you please and I will follow you. But how many of us do that though? How many of us really follow what God says? Because I, I struggle still, guys. I'm not even going to try and stand up here cute at like, you know, I got this all together and worked out. That's not the truth. So Isaiah 55, um, verse 3 to 5. Let us read. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations you do not know you shall want to, sorry, because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel. He, for he has glorified you. I want to read that again. Can you put that back up? I don't think I'm going to make you guys read with me because it distracts me. <laughs> Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel. For he has glorified you. So when I read that scripture, I read it so many times I was blown away because it's talking about a covenant. A covenant is an agreement. A covenant is a promise that this is what he will do. Like, can you imagine... God sending you, well, God gave me a prophetic word for somebody. And he said, to, he said to me to tell this man that your feet will not even step into that nation. But my word through you will. And you will be known in that nation as a mighty man of God. His feet will not even step. God told him that he is going to build, he's going to have land in, in that place. He's going to build houses I saw, um, and this was in Africa, it was in South Africa in particular, and, it, and God said to him that they were going to be um, um, water. So he's going he's to um, cause water to be in the land, and they will know him because of what he's done in the nation through God. This is what the scriptures are saying, like, we are called by God to do mighty things. And he's shown David as a, as a witness of how he has been great to David and how he says that David is a man after my own heart. That's what he says, irregardless of David's mess, irregardless of the things that he's done. He's saying that David is a man after his own heart. And he's saying that he has done this so he can be glorified in us. Like, maybe it's just me, but that excites me. I just get so excited when I... When I read the word, let's go to the next scripture. So what I know that God is saying is that we need to come up closer. We need to listen. We need to open our ears. So listen to this scripture. First Peter 4 and 12 to 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning fiery trials, which, which is to, sorry, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And I know some of you are probably there thinking, really, 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 Debbie. But I've tested God in this. I've seen how... God has done mighty things. And, and, and for, for, the, for the first part of it, in, in that scripture, it speaks about the barrenness, yeah? But do you know in, in Genesis, there was three women who were barren. Rachel, Rebecca, and Sarah. 
straight up in Genesis. And when I looked at that, I was thinking in the very first scripture, in the first, very first book, there's three women that are barren. They're all, they're all family. It's like a generational thing that is going on there. But all of them are barren. And when I was thinking about the fact that they're barren, I was saying, I wonder if these women were having conversations with each other. Because if they were having conversations, they will realize that it's not just me. But you know what the enemy does? He isolates us, in it? He makes us believe that it's just me that's crazy. It, he makes me believe it's just me that was a teenage mum. When I was 14 years old and I gave birth to my son, there was no one, no one around me, nobody that I knew. And I was like the scum of the earth to everybody. I never knew anyone that had experienced it. Funny how aunties start coming out the woodwork, so. Oh, you know, I was, I was young as well, you know. You know, I was young like you. Oh, was you? How old was you? Well, I was 15. Oh, I would never have known that. Oh, righteous one. You know, because when you are going through things, either people are going to join with you and say, you know what? I might not have been there, but I understand. Or they're going to be so righteous that it's like, how dare thou? I was a mum at that age, and not that I'm advocating it, but I work for social services now. And some of these young mums that are coming up, they are ready to take their kids away from them. And I was thinking, if that was me, the way how things are now, they would have taken my, my son away. But I looked after my son. My son was never an award of court. He never was entangled with social services under any circumstances for negligence, for any kind of abuse or nothing. But they would have, because I'm seeing it being done now, these young girls having their babies taken away. Not because they don't have the capacity, but because of their age. And, and, and God has sent me in as an advocate. And I sit there unapologetically in these meetings, in these map meetings with all you 20 people on the screen judging this individual and say, can I just have a word? Can I just have a simple word? I was a mum at 14. When you see the people's faces on the screen. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And I say unapologetically, because my son now is a big grown man. Did I make mistakes? Absolutely. But you know what? I have some of the mothers that come in, and you are 30 years old, and you do not know how to change a nappy. You do not know how to hold a baby. Because nobody's shown you. So I'm saying that to say, when you are going through things, think it not strange. Think it not strange. Pastor said it last week, and I know that we all chuckled and, and so forth, saying, oh, some people wear condoms. So we don't know whether they are sexually active because there is no manifestation. And I'm gonna tell on myself, because when I, I had a child out of wedlock in church, and yes, there was people that was fornicating because God showed me. I had, a, I had a vision of five people within the congregation. And I go off on a tangent, but I think that this is for someone in the house. And, and God showed me this. And the way how I was dealt with and my children's dad was dealt with, it was terrible. So I salute you, Pastor, for how you and the rest of the church dealt with our brother because it was a strange thing. But the Bible says, think it not strange. Think it not strange because these are the things that will go on in our lives around us. And what we need to do is partner with each other. The Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of? Absolutely, because we are testifying. We are, not, we are putting the devil to shame. We are, we are talking about the nonsense that the enemy will cause us to do. And when we expose him, what does he have to do? He has to flee. If you hide, he will cause you to feel shame. He will, feel, it will cause you to feel as though it is just you. But when you expose the enemy, he has to flee. Because he has no longer a hold on you. I tell her myself all the time. I tell her myself on, all the time. You can go on my social media. I tell her myself all the time because you, you will not keep me bound. 
You will not try and make it out as though I'm the only one that is crazy out here. I'm the only one that is doing madness. You will not be able to make me feel shameful because I read the word of God and the word of God says, think it not strange. That's what it says. There's another scripture that says that um, about us being tempted, you know, that we are tempted and carried away by our own lust. So, you know, some people like, oh, God is tempting. No, God doesn't tempt you. He tests you. That's what he does. And there's a big difference between being tempted and tested. So let us plod on. The first thing that I actually said, the pastor said I got to wrap up for half past. But you know, my gift is speaking. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, <laughs> because it's testing me. And he wants me to be obedient. So let me get back. So um, the first point that I would like to make, I've got three points and then I will run on. That was just the in introduction, guys. I haven't even got into it yet. So the first point is don't hide from God. Don't hide from God. When you are going through challenges, when you are going through situations, don't hide from God. He sees you. He sees you. He sees you before. And so um, the devil will make you feel as though it is just you experiencing this in life. And the fact is, those three women were barren. And Hannah... Hannah actually, well, I didn't mention Hannah, but Hannah, she was barren. And if you know, she called out to God. She went to the temple. She was unashamed. She didn't hide. She went to God and she cried and she cried and she cried and she cried some more. Till people, can you imagine the crying that she was doing now? Because they thought that she was drunk. That tells me that that cry was some proper crying, rolling on the floor, looking kind of crazy, you know. Like, sometimes I think to myself, if you sort of see me in my room, you sort of think I'm mad. I'm like, <laughs> my face is all a mess. I, you know, I do some crazy things before the Lord. But Hannah, she didn't run from God. She didn't hide. She went before God and said, this is my situation. This is what the problem is here. I am barren and I want a child. And she continually reached out to God. Her focus was on the barrenness but she focused on the God who was going to help her. Where is your focus? Is it solely on the situation? Is it solely on your challenges? Is it um, only on the things that you are not attaining rather than what you should and could attain if you was just to bring it to God? Genesis 3, verse 8 to 10. And they heard a sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, um, the Lord God, among the trees in the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And yeah. That's what happens. When, when things are not good, when things are not going right, we hide. We hide from God. And God is like, where are you? He's calling you. I'm here. I want to help you. I want to assist you. One of the things is, is that there's always consequences to our actions. And sometimes people don't want to face the consequences. So they rather not go to God. But you know what? You're going to face it anyway. Why not face it? with God? Why not allow God to do that work in you and heal you and restore you? So in that, God is saying, you are naked, you are you're feeling ashamed right now. And that's how we can feel. The enemy can make us feel ashamed of the very thing that we've done because we might not have that fancy house and that car. We might not be married. We might not have the kids. We might not be the best person in our job. We might not be a snappy dresser. We might not be all these things. And he makes us feel ashamed. He makes us say, you know what? I don't even want to bring myself forward to do this because everybody is going to look at me. Can you imagine if God says, there's a, somebody says, like Alfonso said, there's a word in the house. Somebody come and share the word. And you know that the heel of your shoe is brought down. You're going to be like, no, I'm not coming up here. They're going to wish to be looking at my shoes. So I'm not going to do it. Not anyone's watching your shoes. We're just thankful for the word. 
we're thankful that you was obedient. Do you get what I'm saying? But it's those little things that can stop us. It might sound silly and trivial, but it can be. It, it can be something minor. Do you get what I mean? Because the enemy will make us feel ashamed that we will not do the things that God tells us to do. Even when you repent, even when you repent, the enemy will still say, yeah, but you repented though, but you know that you might just do that again. So there's no point in really repenting because you've done that like 10 times. But the Bible says to forgive them seven times 70. And God is not like man. He said he's cast our sin far from the east to the west. They're far. They're at the, the uttermost, guttermost, somewhere. I don't know where he put. But they, he doesn't pay attention to that. But the enemy will say, pointless repenting. Pointless asking God to forgive you. Because you've done it more than once. You've done it twice. Actually, you've done that 20 times. Come on. Don't even bother to repent now. And I've been there. I've been there where I've just been like, yeah, maybe, hmm, maybe I might do that again. So I'm not going to repent. He wants us to feel ashamed and he wants us to run from God. So Adam and Eve hid from God. Are you hiding? Are you focused on the shame and the guilt? Are you focused on the things that you've done? What are you focused on? Because if you focus on those things, it draws you further and further from God. It doesn't bring you closer and closer to him. So we're going to go to Jonah. And some of you might be familiar with Jonah. You might be Jonah's cousin sitting up in here. <laughs> Where you run like Jonah. So Jonah 1. Did I write it down wrong? Jonah, I've got Jonah 1, verse 3. What did I put? Anyway, go to Jonah. Okay. But Jonah arose and flew to Tarshish. So before this, God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. He tells him to go to Nineveh because the people are wicked. And God wants him to go there to give them a word so that they repent and turn to God. Jonah, in his wisdom, decides, I ain't going. The people are wicked, isn't it? Make God bun them. <laughs> that's what Jonah's thinking. Let God bun them because that's what God was going to do. But he wanted Jonah to go there to like be the bridge, to be that one that's going to go there to help them. Jonah's like, I ain't doing that. Jonah's wicked. <laughs> no, I'm saying that and I'm laughing, but some of us are wicked because we might have a word for someone. We might have a word and we say, we're so full of ourselves that no, I'm not going to give that. Supposing I'm wrong. Supposing that they won't listen to me. Suppose, get over yourself. Even if you say it that, and that person don't want to receive it, you've delivered it. If you go and deliver, go and take something to someone's house, go and take shopping to them and that lot, and you leave it outside, and at least you've delivered it. You've, mind you, I'm thinking about the man that delivered my mum's stuff and put it in the bin. <laughs> You're wrong. Shouldn't have put it in a dustbin. The dustbin got emptied. You was wrong. Anyway. <laughs> but Jonah arose and, and flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord, no, let's, let's stop it there. So what he was trying to do, he was trying to run away from God, essentially. Run away from the calling of God and let the people burn. That's what he was trying to do. And if you read that story, it's really, really, really profound because if, if, if some, of, some of us probably run and we find ourselves in situations and we're like, devil, get behind me. You're a wicked devil, you're wicked. And we're praying and we're fasting and we're doing and that and nothing changes. Nothing changes. With Jonah, it just got worse and worse. And the people are just like, well, hold on a minute. All of us, haven't done anything and they all look at Jonah you must be the dude where things why things are going wrong for us and he was he was the one on the boat and they were like do you want us to die but you know what in that in that revelation of Jonah do you know that all of those people got saved all of them worshipped God so even when Jonah was running from God God was still using him God still turned that situation around for his good all of those men turned to his God all of them. And so, are you hiding from God? Are you trying to run 
from God? Are you trying to say, I can't do this, I won't do this? Because hiding from God gets you nowhere. You are going to go full circle and come right the way back around. Have you ever experienced that? Where you're just like, hold on, this place seems familiar. I think I've been here before. It's probably different people dressed differently, but I've been here before. Don't hide from God. Don't hide from him. We're going to go to point two, and then we're going to go to point three quickly, and then I'm going to wrap up. Follow instructions. Obedience. The scripture actually says obedience is better than sacrifice. 1 Samuel 15, 22. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in... Sorry, why is, my, why is my reading like this? So Samuel said, as the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed and to heed then... Do you know why? Because it's King James, that's why. And to heed, because <laughs> I'm doing and I'm thinking, why am I stumbling on my words? Um, than the fat of rams. So basically, that scripture, what it's saying is like, is your burnt offering better than you sacrificing unto God, being obedient to God? So you can bring everything to God. You can bring your tithes and your offerings and everything like that. But if you're not obedient to God, he's like, keep it. I just want you to be obedient to me. But they used to give offerings, didn't they? They gave burnt offerings. And the burnt offerings, sometimes they put that in place of being obedient to God. It's like, well, I'm being obedient in this area, God. But in this area, I'm not. And that's all right, because I'm giving you my tithes and I'm giving you my offering. And I'm coming to prayer. But I'm not being obedient when God says to me, do you know what? Go and speak to that person. Go and do whatever it is. Go and sing. Go and share the word whatever it may be God is saying obedience is better than sacrifice follow instructions instructions are very important for us to follow let's go to um, Luke 5 verse 2 to 3 uh, what is the script what is the verse before that So it, was, so, it, so it was, as the multitude pressed against him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of hmm, G and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were fishing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, like push him out a little. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. What he basically did, he, he, was in the, he was on the land, got into the boat, went out, and because um, Simon was there, Simon Peter it is, I believe, he was there with his nets, getting them prepared. The next scripture, which is verse 4 to 8, says, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, master, we have told all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And the reason why this scripture was really poignant was because God said to me that in the midst of us transitioning from here into the next building, do not pay attention to the money. Do not pay attention to what we need to pay. Pay attention to what he wants to do. Pay attention to the people that he wants us to win. Do not pay attention to the money. Because, the, because of obedience and because we are going to move, he is saying to us directly, pay attention to the things that I have called you to do. And the Bible says it, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. But you know what we do? We focus on the figures. We focus on the lack. We focus on the things that we don't have versus what it is. If God tells us to move, he tells us to move. He's going to make a, he's going to make a way. He's going to provide. I've tested him too many times. 
too many times to count. He is always faithful. Always is going to be faithful. He will uphold his part of the bargain. Are we going to uphold ours? Are we going to say, do you know what? I'm going to be obedient because Simon Peter, at the end, he's there saying, like, depart from me. I'm, I'm not even good to be in your presence because I wasn't even thinking about letting down my nets. I wasn't even thinking, do you know what? If I do this, because he says we've been toiling all night. We've been praying about this building for, for a minute now. We've been toiling all night. Who tells us that we, we can't have? It's only us that tells us that. But God has already made a way for us. So what do we do? We get putting out the nets. That's what we do. And we say to God, you do whatever you need to do in order to make sure that this happens. Because the funds, he will take care of that. He will take care of it. But our focus is on the lack. And God is saying to us, where is your focus today? Where is your focus? The final thing is don't be silent. Don't be silent. Proverbs 18 and 21. Let us just wrap this up quickly because it is hot up here. It really is. <laughs> okay. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. The reason why it's important is because what we're speaking over ourselves, what we're saying to ourselves, what we're saying about things and situation can hamper what God is telling us to do. When, when I'm saying don't be silent, speak the word. If you don't know what to say to yourself, just go into the word. Ask God to find you scriptures. Go on Google. Google will find you scriptures. Find words that you can speak to yourself that will affirm yourself, that will strengthen you. But don't be silent. Don't be silent. Because I tell you what, with the silence, silence to God, the enemy will fill your mind. That's what he would do. If you're silent to God and you're not declaring and you're not, you're not speaking life into yourself, the enemy will fill your mind with foolishness. Absolute foolishness. So don't be silent. Samuel 1 and 10. This is where Hannah cries out to God. And she was, was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish because she knew that she could go to God. She can call upon the Lord. She didn't need to be silent. She didn't need to sit in her situation. And people look at her and people would have known that Hannah was barren. But she knew that she didn't have to sit in her situation, that she could actually go to God and she could speak life. She could declare. She could ask God for what she wants. And what, what happened? Elijah came, gave her a word, and she gave, gave, um, brought forth a child. Psalms 10, 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crown you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. The reason why it's important is because we have to understand what the word of God is saying to us. We have to be in a place where we can understand that when we are declaring, when we are speaking, when we are proclaiming the word of God, that things shift, things change. People's lives are different. But when you are focused on the negative, you will never accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. What are you focusing on today? Have you been focusing on the negative? Have you been focusing on the things that is not working for you? Have you been focusing on the things that you haven't got? Because I come to challenge you today to shift that mindset and to believe that what you can have, what God says you can have, you can have. And the more you focus on that and the more you declare it and you believe it, that God will enlarge you. He will strengthen you. He will give you everything that you need in the season that you actually need it. Can you stand to your feet as I close? So if you're taking notes, I've, um, I've written the word as an acronym, FOCUS. And this is just as a reminder, so it's quick for you to remember. F, forget the former things. Forget the former things. Forget the former things. Forget the things that have stopped you to this point. 
Forget the things that you have been focusing that haven't got you anywhere. Hasn't. It just causes heartache, causes frustration, causes shame, causes guilt. Forget the former things. Oh, obedience. Obedience. We heard it said in the scriptures, obedience is better than sacrifice. So yeah, you're giving your tithes and your offering and you're doing all these wonderful things and that lot for God. But are you being obedient to what he really wants you to do? What is he really saying to you? See, communicate. Talk to God. Speak to him about your challenges. Don't hide from him. He sees you. He hears you. He wants to do a great thing in you. That's what he wants to do. He already said it in Isaiah 55, what he would do. He said, I want, I want to show you off like how I showed off David. I want you to see this. But if we think that by us speaking to God, he's just going to, you know, cause us to feel ashamed, we're wrong. It's the enemy that makes us feel ashamed. So communicate with God about your challenges. You, I put you utilize the gifts and talents God has placed in you. Because when you take your focus off of the negative, a whole world opens up to you. You know that song? A whole new world. <laughs> Disney days. Five children. It's a whole new world that opens up to you. And you realize the gifts and talents that you've got in you that you didn't even know was there. Because you was focusing on the negative the whole time. Utilize the gifts and talents that God has in you to bless and strengthen other people. And in turn, it will strengthen you. Scriptures, S, scriptures. Seek out the word because it will speak life into your very soul. It will cause you to shift. It will cause you to change. I'm telling you guys, I'm not telling you something that I haven't lived. I'm living it right now. And I'm, and I'm eating the word of God like for breakfast, lunch and dinner. I'm having to because the challenges are thick and fast. When God is positioning you for greatness, you have to endure a lot with much, with much gifts and talents, there is a responsibility that God has. When God has positioned you to do great things, there is a great responsibility that comes with that. I hope that this has helped someone. I hope that it is shifting minds, that you are believing what God has said to you, that the very things that you have been focusing on that you will now take your focus off of that and onto what God is telling you to. Because the enemy will forever be distracting you. He will forever make you feel ashamed. He will forever do that. He ain't going to just do it today and not doing it in two years' time. That's his job. He will be redundant otherwise. That's his job to make your life a misery. So I just really just wanted to pray because I know that God is a God that hears and answers. And when I came in here, I felt really heavy. Um, my mind was just really heavy. And, and when I thought about it, because I went upstairs to the, to the prayer team and I prayed with them and they prayed for me. But um, when I thought about it, I thought, this isn't me. This is the heaviness of people that is coming into the house, that is feeling some kind of way. And God has sent me to help you to untwine all of that stuff that is going on in your mind and for you to think straight. And it's a process. Don't get me wrong. I'm not just saying just, just through this. God will start to speak to you in your dreams. He will speak to you continually. If you open your mind, open your heart to him, he will be able to shift that way of focus to where he wants you to be. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up my voice to you even now, Lord. Knowing, Lord Jesus, that you are Alpha and you are Omega. You are the beginning and you are the end. You've already gone ahead of us. You've already seen every person in this room. You've already seen every situation, every challenge, Lord. You've already seen it. You see where their focus is on. Lord, and you desire for their focus to be shift this day, for it to be shift on the things of God that no longer will they continue to think of the negative to see the negative to lean into the negative but they will shift 
and understand that you are calling them up higher, that you are doing a great thing within them, that their minds, Lord Jesus, the Lord wants to captivate your mind. He wants your mind to be renewed. He wants your mind to be renewed. Your mind is renewed by the Word of God. So every opportunity that you get, put the Word on, put on a preaching, put on some worship, because God wants to transform your mind. Lord, I pray that you breathe afresh on your people this day, that this Word, Lord Jesus, will take root, that it will take root in their soul, that it will bring forth fruit, that we will be able to see a manifestation of your power, that we will be able to see a manifestation of your glory because they have shift focus, because they have shifted into a place of understanding that you, Lord Jesus, have gone ahead of them. I loosen the angels of the Lord even now. I loosen the angels of the Lord even now to minister, to shift, to shift them, to speak, to speak. Let there be a refreshing and a renewing that will come to their mind today that they will not be able to remain the same, that they will not be able to remain the same, that situations and circumstances that they're caught up in, that they will see another way out. The enemy may be saying to you that there is no way, but I declare there is a new way. There is a new way this day, and God will show you the way of escape. God will show you the way of escape. The enemy has kept you bound, but I declare today that you are free because who the Son has set free is free indeed. And God is shifting minds. God is shifting your mind. God is causing you to think differently, to believe differently, to draw closer to Him. Father, in the name of Jesus, do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Do what only you can do now in the hearts and minds of your people. That their focus will not remain the same. You say, though we walk for the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For thou art with us, thy rod and thy staff comfort us. God, comfort them this day. Comfort them this day. Comfort them this day. Let them see that shift. Let them see that shift. Let them see that shift. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for watching this message. We'd love you to leave us a comment and let us know what your takeaways were and more importantly, what you're going to do with the word that you've heard. Come back next week as we equip and encourage you with the word of God.